Good evening again from beautiful downtown Canterbury, New Hampshire. We're gonna try to repair this pretty challenging leg. We're gonna look at this old piece of furniture and try to learn some things from it. And maybe some questions will arise and little experiences we can get from looking at a good old piece. You know, when I apprenticed years ago, three plus decades ago, I um, learned a, a lot about furniture making from repairing antiques. I was in a, a shop that regularly took in antiques to be restored and repaired. And I got into that here and there, but most of my work was reproducing antiques. So it was building furniture from scratch. This table has been hanging around for a while. I swear, I look at this and I go, how in the world am I gonna fix this? Because I've never done this before. But you can see the first thing we have here is the main issue with this table is that it's a two-legged table. So it's not too helpful. I mean, you could always lean it on a wall, I guess, but here they are, broken off. This one was broken. This one was broken, and this is something you learn when you have old furniture like this. You're going to find somebody else's repair attempt. <laughs> Sometimes you have to struggle to get around a sloppy repair and make something work. This one was already doweled together, and it had broken again, and it looked like kind of a wimpy uh, pine dowel of some sort, but... So it, it had broken twice now. So this other one was a fairly clean break, but so how do you get things like this? How do you come about pieces like this? Well, this one, I had a, a customer who I did do some repairs for here in Canterbury. She brought this one over one day and I looked at it and I, I was kind of puzzled with how I would fix it. And it has literally sat like this since she dropped it off. Now, she, she was going to have me fix it, but I gave her an estimate of what it would be. And she was like, uh, do you want it? <laughs> so it was basically going to be thrown out. It wasn't worth it to her to restore it. And I get that. Um, but there was in the drawer a purchase slip but they got it from a an auctioneer an appraiser in uh, Henniker, new hampshire on october 9th 1988 they paid four hundred dollars the dollar value in 1988 today is worth two dollars and 44 cents so two dollars and 44 cents value of 400 brought it brings that up to right about 975 dollars in today's money almost a thousand dollar table now is it really worth that a lot has changed in uh period furniture like this antiques over the last 30 years it was kind of a heyday back then in the late 80s a lot there was a a strong collectability to this type of furniture to 18th century reproductions queen anne chippendale federal and this would fall into the federal style this would actually be, be considered a sheridan style end table something happened about in the mid uh teens i think it was around 2000 2005 was the first time i heard it some influential organization maybe architectural digest in new york city wrote an article about and tagged it as brown furniture <laughs> that it just wasn't cool anymore these things come around though it's just i don't know how long so it wouldn't be a bad idea to pick up some nice antiques if you're young enough <laughs> who knows and maybe this will be worth restoring so anyway, that's all to say, this is brown furniture. It's, you know, anything that was natural wood, like walnut or mahogany. And people are taking this stuff and they're painting it now, you know, and have been trying to make it look cool and contemporary. But anyway, let's learn a little bit from this before we dive in and try to fix it. And what you'll see about it is, let's take the drawer out. This, it's all mahogany. This is all genuine mahogany, and 
as is true in most Sheridan pieces. This one's a little more stylized in that it's got the drawer front is veneered with a peach of a peach, a peach of cross, crotch mahogany, a piece of crotch mahogany veneer. Okay, and then the sides as well. Look at there's a nice piece of crotch mahogany, and the grain's running this away, and then on the back as well. And I notice I got a little issue back here. You know, see this? This isn't as dark back here. Maybe it wasn't in the sun. But it's on there pretty good. They even veneered the legs here. But listen. Hear that? That's the veneer is flapping and it's loose. And someone did a repair here. They, they repair, re, <laughs> removed this bead and put in a, a patch. You can hardly notice it. See that square? <laughs> What the heck? That's horrible. So that's a really bad patch. What you normally want to do is when you patch, you want to cut a diagonal line, like a kind of long, so almost like a scarf joint, so that the edge is hidden. You never want to patch with a hard 90 degree cross cut across the veneer. It just shows so much. So a, a angular cut would have been better. And Maybe a piece that matched the color would have been better as well. I guess I, it might have been that it just, I don't know. They were thinking maybe it was going to lighten over time. So I might have to pull that off and get this veneer back on. And it might be worth replacing that beautiful patch. Now, more than likely, this veneer is on there with hide glue. So I could just take a steam iron, dampen this a little bit, and then with a paper towel dampened, Put it on there with the steam iron and this will just release and you can repair that pretty easily. Let's take a look at the top first of all. This is a beautiful piece of mahogany on this top. One board, okay? It is one solid board all the way across. You've got the cathedral figure in here and then it moves over to Cortison on the sides. It's very typical of a period piece. Now the Sheridan style this type of table, um, if it was a little more dressy, normally they would have reeded legs. And it'd be really, some of them are exquisite and collectible and like real masterpieces. This is, this is kind of like a nice, almost like a country nice <laughs> version of Sheridan. It's not got the reeded legs. It's got the similar shape. It does have the crotch mahogany veneer, beautiful mahogany on the top, and some nice pulls. These are the original pulls. But that, that mahogany on that top is just beautiful and solid. And most of this Sheridan style furniture, when you see it, it's right around 1800, 1810, 20. So I actually am not dead certain on this, but I would be pretty confident that this is close to 200 years old. It's right in that ballpark for the style. Okay, but it's not a great 200-year-old piece. Uh, still, we can learn from it. So, the other thing to note is that top is ultra thin. I mean, look at that thing. That one board top, it's just over 5 sixteenths thick. You know, a lot of times when we have our show our end tables, the top is a three quarters of an inch thick. So here's our front drawer. It's got some nice veneer, and it's got another beautiful seamless repair here. It's hidden better than the other one because they did make a shearing diagonal cut. So that is better. It's a little darker. That's where you can't see it. But see, that's a good illustration of how it is. And then you can take off the pull. This is an old, you can tell that old style, kind of like a stamp pull. It's not solid brass. And look here, behind the brass escutcheon or pull, you expect discoloration. It should be different than the face. Uh, this this is, was clearly refinished, and they probably did it at the time this piece of veneer was replaced and sanded it up. Normally, the drawer front would be darker a little darker, and this would be a lighter color mahogany right here. But it's all the same. You also can tell those poles were not replaced because of the impression. Everything is true. Here's the real 
old, that's the old cell knot in here, the round kind, and it's kind of coarsely threaded. This is a newer knot on this one, but this is the original over here. Uh, now, check out the drawer. This is a traditionally made drawer. It's white pine, so that tells me that it's north of probably, well, in Baltimore they did use white pine, but this is probably up in this northeast region somewhere this, this was made. It's got a nice white pine. And the dovetails, last week we talked about making fine dovetails. Look at that. Kind of chunky. <laughs> Very fine on the bottom, and look at that fine little one right there. That's not even quarter inch across. It's about three sixteenths there and comes to a fine point. But really, not the nicest laid out, is it? It's kind of off-center, and there's one. And then some great repair artist drove a couple nails in there later on. I hate when that happens. But there you go. You see this a lot in these repairs. It's like, oh, okay, I'll show that, that hand-cut dovetail up and drive a couple nails. You know, look at those brats. <laughs> but the back looks nice. You've got those three. And this is very traditional, just like the way I always show to make drawers. The drawer bottom is sliding in from the back in a groove up under the drawer back. And the drawer side comes down, and there's your solid bottom. And note how crude that is. This is still the rough sawn lumber. It was rough sawn. They never hand planed it. They only hand planed the interior. Very common for old pieces. They wouldn't waste time on the inside or bottoms of things. The saw marks are not rhythmic and in line. They, they change and they alter a little bit. You know what that means? That means this was not sawn on a typical uh, like sawmill. Uh, like a band saw mill. This was sawn with a pit saw. One guy is down in a pit and the log is up above and he pulls down while the guy on top pulls back up. And they just saw through the logs that way. And that's why you get like an arrhythmic kind of saw cut. So I can see the, the saw marks here and they're, they vary a lot. So that was either pit sawn you know, now that I think of it, that is the rough sawn though. See, that's not like that's not like it it was sawn in the shop. There's a chance they resawed it in the shop, but I doubt it. I think that was right off of the cut. But there you go. So we've got uh, our nice board. We've got our sides are three eighths of an inch. Okay, so typically made piece. And then let's look at the case. So down here. You've got kind of a, in the leg, you've got a tenon and then another tenon here, but it's just lapped in. So you've got a twin tenon here, but this one is inside the leg and this one is not. Then check this out. Can you see that little spot right there? See how I can flex that? You see that with the camera? Mm -hmm. That's a dovetail. So this is the top divider that's dovetailed in from the top. And there are the maker's saw marks. 200 year old, you've got these hand saw marks. And that's why I talk about that a lot. Like, hey, why not just leave your marks? And then even the legs are numbered. One, two, three, four. And they're in Roman numerals for when they were gonna assemble. Inside, you've got this, the gap is filled again with white pine. It just fills there to guide the drawer. And then the drawer runner is simply nailed on right there. And it's just white pine, nothing fancy. And then these glue blocks here actually initially were glued all around to hold that top. But you can see these blocks here, they pulled away by a little over an eighth of an inch. So this top was initially just glue blocked on. Someone came in later and repaired and ran some screws in there. Those are newer style screws. So they just chopped in and ran the screws in. And this block is not doing anything either. It was just, it released from the underside. So the good news is the top didn't crack, even though they glue blocked it all the way around. So that shows you how resilient mahogany is. It's quite, 
stable, you know, over that length in this amount of time, it only moved a strong eighth of an inch. To refinish this would be, I wouldn't really refinish, I would just clean it good with mineral spirits and steel wool, like paint thinner, and then wipe it all down, let it dry completely, and then I'm almost certain there's just a varnish on here like shellac. I would shellac this, put on a thin coat of shellac. So you don't want to strip it really, just clean it and you could add a little shellac and you know, it's not that kind of valuable piece, but it would revive it a little bit. It's kind of dead looking and needs a little help. All right, so enough of the inspection. Now we've got our problem. We've got to join these legs and this one was over here. I'm gonna just talk about this one for starters, okay? This one was a fresher break. It wasn't repaired before. So you can kind of see the, the tear of the materials here. And I can see kind of the lines and there's a deeper hole here, which makes me think this goes back something like this. Now it's really hard to match up those fibers. So you can't really get them flat again. So I'm gonna cut that flat and trim this, anything that's standing high there and get it set again. Now, I think the way to go about this is doweling it together. Now you could knock the whole table apart and try to chuck this up somehow into a lathe or a drill press and drill straight down, right? Chuck it in there. That'd be tough and plus you're taking the whole table apart. I don't want to take the table apart. So I've got to figure out how I'm going to drill a hole here for a fresh dowel and have it be true and aligned and then do the same into the leg so that when I plug this in it will be look like it was never repaired. It won't be like at an angle like that. That would not be good. <laughs> that's not what we're shooting for, all right? But uh, I also want a dowel in there that's not gonna break like this one. So I'm not gonna use pine. I can see that that's some type of pine. And looks like it might be yellow pine. Yeah, it looks like it. But it's still, it's not a good, I'm gonna use something harder than that. But, so I think a half inch dowel is about right. This is a half inch. And if you go much larger, then you can see that dimension in there is only an inch wide in there. So if I drill in here and I'm, I don't want to be heavier than that because then I'm going to start weakening the leg. So you're trying to find this comfortable medium. But if I get this nicely aligned with a good dowel close to three inches long into each side, I think we'll be good to go. So that's our task. We're going to we're going to make a doweling block. And we're going to align it in such a way that we can drill down through this block and achieve a good true parallel with the axis of the leg and centered. We want to be centered and true along the axis of this leg in both sides, okay? So, here's my strategy. I've got a piece of uh, maple. It's, um, it's hard maple. I'm gonna turn it down to the diameter of my leg stock here, okay? So if I take my calipers, I'll just let it just touch there. Okay, so I can feel it's just touching and that I know measures about an inch and a half. This is the leg that goes here. You can see, see I'm just bumping it. That's nice. So I'm, I'm, those are all the same size. So what I'm thinking is if I turn this into a cylinder, the same diameter as that and that, then I can tack some long strips of wood onto this, like maybe four of them, and let them overextend. And I should be able to fit that right down over, fairly snug, over this column. 
and it will be aligning that cylinder with the column underneath. Those, gu those sticks on the sides will be like guides on all four, you know, four of them. Slide down, and I'm close enough to alignment. Now I have to have the hole already drilled down the center of that cylinder. So here's the trick. We want to make absolutely certain that hole that we drill down the center, it's going to have to be a half inch hole because that's going to be our drill guide to drill down into the leg. So we need that hole to be dead center of that cylinder. So the way we achieve that is not by turning the cylinder and then trying to drill down the middle. We're going to drill the hole first and then turn the cylinder using the hole as the axis for the cylinder. So let's go ahead and drill this hole first. I'm going to mark the center. And like I said, this is all theoretical at this point. We're going to see this work. So I'm just, this is pretty oversized, obviously. So I've got a lot to play with here. I'm just going to drill this. That's pretty close to the middle. And let's get an all point on here. Okay, so we're just going to drill straight down. Now, if I happen to waver or something, it's not a big deal because, like I said, we're going to use that hole, no matter what it is, as our axis. So we're going to head on over to the drill press. All right, so here we go. I'm going to, I could just try to hold this, but I'm going to end bore it. So I'm going to be, I'm going to snug this up and... This is just going to help me. This hand screw clamp is going to help me hold it flat from spinning. Okay, I think I'm going to make sure that didn't come off the table. I want to just keep it on the table so I'm going to get as close to vertical as I am. All right, so I'm going to just bring the point down, see if it hits my little impression there. And there it is. All right, let's be boring. This is going to squeal. Sorry. All right. So let's go. We're going to be working on this one. This is a little smaller one. So let's set up our calipers. Make sure we're close. Okay, we're just lightly touching. That's what we want. And now we can come over here. Oh, you know what? I'm going to move this book out of the way. I forgot I meant to show you. This is, these are some examples of Sheridan tables in here. Just so you know, I wasn't blowing smoke. These are... Uh, some reeded tables similar to ours here. We've got these turned and then these turned feet. There's a little more higher style. But you can see they did a lot of this reading and slender. These have a little finer slender style. This was 1790. 1790. But you see a lot in the early 1800s as well. All right, I'm going to set this over. Okay, so we're going to get this now chucked up. And we want to turn around the center. Um, I, I would just take, before that, I just took a uh, piece of maple like this, and I chucked it in and turned it and set the calipers carefully to a half inch. And then I tested it in the hole. And so I just wanted to show you, I'm not going to turn the dowels, but I made my own dowels out of this. And here they are. They're half inch. They fit pretty well. Okay, so I've got my dowels all set, ready to go. And now I just need to turn the cylinder over uh, to the same size as my leg. So to get it in here, we're going to use, we want to center it at this end. So we're going to use 
a face chuck here and I I already turned a what's called a jam chuck so I've, I turned this to a half inch tenon and it's going to be kind of press fitted on there and that's the center so this is my face plate chuck that goes on and I had earlier I tightened in that block of maple and then you just turn that small tenon and what that does let me turn it on it's dead center because it was turned right on the lathe at the other end we've got a nice long tapered live center and that's large enough that it'll center in the hole on the other end so I just have to get this end on it turns on there nice and then this other end I'm going to bring up and lock it in. I'm just going to snug it up. And what we've got now is we are turning on that, one, that half inch hole axis. So whatever cylinder we create will be beautifully aligned with that in the dead center. So I'm going to bring up my little tool rest and let's take it for a spin. Make sure nothing's hitting. Let's get my safety glasses. We'll start turning away. We're gonna go for, this is our caliper, okay? Right here. So I'll start with a uh, roughing gouge. Here we go. Got a little ways to go, not much. Roughing gouge is fun, it's super easy. It's you're just holding the tool, so once the bevel makes contact, I hold that angle. I'm resting on the bevel lightly, and then I'm getting a nice shearing cut, so you end up with these sweet shavings. Rather than coming in perpendicularly and getting a scraping, dusty cut. See that, it's just dust. But that's a safe kind of way to turn with some chisels, but it's just dust. Come in at an angle like this, and it's so different, you're getting a nice shear. Just a little more here. All right, so I want to be pretty careful to get this cylinder dead aligned. So I'm going to make a, some depth stops quickly here with a parting tool. Okay, now we can take the skew and use it as a scraper. Tom, does the skew get warm or hot? Does the what? The skew get warm or hot? Um, when you're scraping, it gets, it might get a little warm, but not, not warm enough, barely, I, I don't feel any heat. When you're when you're cutting properly, it shouldn't. You don't. Your chisels aren't getting hot. They're they're shearing the wood or sh making a nice paring cut. So now I'm just fine tuning. See, I'm looking to feel and hear the exact same thing. It's a little louder right here.
This is about the simplest thing you can do in turning is make a cylinder. Okay, that's it. Now, let's, um, I don't know if it'll matter at all, but I'm gonna just tweak the ends. Just to make sure they're square with the rest. Just gonna go in with a nice Tighten that up. I just loosened it with that cut. And the other end. Okay, nice and clean. Okay, that's it. So now we've got our cylinder. To that size okay now let's get I've got some sticks here maple sticks what I'm gonna do is glue and tack these strips on so let's get my I've got my little 5 8 pin nails in here to get these sticks on here quickly and easily so this end is going to have to be about three inches to, to be a good guide here. So I'm going to set, just go ahead and get some glue on here. I don't need much, I don't need much more than that. Getting this first one on is a trick. I'm going to set it back right about there. So I'm going to align this as best I can. Okay. Would it have worked if you had just kept it square? Uh, no. You still would have to have made that hole in such a way that you were assured it was centered. Um, so that's where it gets tricky. But this way, you guarantee. All right, so now I've got that. Now I'll just flip it over. I'll do this opposite side one here. Set this back a little bit. I'm just going to try to hold it true and opposite the other side. The suggestion was made a little earlier to consider a metal dowel. A metal dowel? A metal dowel. Uh, I guess you could. I think this is going to be strong. I think the leg might break before this maple dowel. <laughs> Maple's stronger than the mahogany, but something about being a woodworker, I don't, I try not to introduce metal where wood is joining with wood, you know. Um, just prefer if it's possible. But where it is useful for reinforcement, it's definitely a good way to go Use metal. All right, so I'm just trying to get this one about 90 degrees-ish of that one. Michael's curious, does the original leg go all the way to the top, top piece or does it stop at the lower frame? That's the original leg. Oh, yeah, it goes all the way through. Uh, yes, it, it's definitely all the way and then it was veneered. So because of the way that it's got the tenons running in this way. And I forgot to mention that the sides are, you can actually see the tenons. They're all mortise and tenon. The sides are into the legs. Okay, there we go. Now we're just gonna flip it this way and get the last one. And these are just some maple sticks about Five sixteenths. If anybody there. arrives late to this, they're going to be really curious what you're doing. What in the world is that guy doing? So this is, yeah, this is uh, resourceful, you know. A lot of times you have to make jigs 
And here we are trying to fix an old broken piece and we have to come up with this jig that achieves what we're after here. Now let's, um, this one's sized for here. Now let's see how it works. So here's the side, goes down over. Now it's just a little bit, a little bit loose at the bottom. So what I want to do is run some tape. I'm going to run some tape around the leg because this is turned slightly smaller down here. So in order to get it as a tr true guide, I need to just shim it out a little bit. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, I think that'll bring it out a little bit. All right, so I'm hitting that. I need a little more, a little around here as well. So this is just kind of figuring it out <laughs> as we go. A mad scientist here. All right, there. That's snug on there. Now I'm going to put a clamp on each side, and by clamping it like that, now I feel like that cylinder is truly aligned with that cylinder and it's going to give me a, a good feeling for drilling it out. Okay, so let's go ahead and I would like to let that glue set up but don't have that luxury. Now before I drill it I want to clean that off. That's where that raggedness is out there. Let's saw some of that off. Just use the Japanese saw. And, um, I'm not trying to get it quite all the way. I want to pair the last bit. Kind of. It's not much there. I'm going to come in with the chisel. Yeah, here we go. Nice little sweeping cut like that. Cross end grain, where you're going here. Just using that collar as a guide, get it roughly flat across. Okay, now we're ready to try this. Let's see if we've got, if we need to add any more tape one more time. I don't like how it's doing that. But let's see, when I put the clamps on, I think it'll be okay. Okay. Okay, that's resting on that. That's good. And let's get it from the other direction. That's pretty nice. Looks pretty true. That cylinder, this is all about just holding that cylinder. Now that cylinder is pretty solid. I'm going to just clamp this table to the bench so it doesn't slide around much during the drilling process. I should have a blanket or something down there, but my bench is all right right now. All right, there we are. Nice and solid. Now we're ready to drill. So I've got the half inch drill bit here. I've got a long kind of drill bit for this. <laughs> the dowels measure five and a quarter. So I just need to go a good two and five eighths. 
Don't you need to add the length of the guy? Did someone say that? Yeah, you do. You have to add your dance. Yes, you do. Yeah, you got lots of friends out here noticing. Thank you, friends. <laughs> That's four, so I want to go six and five eighths. Okay. I wish I had practiced this, but here we go. See what happens. That feels fairly firm, though, and aligned with that existing cylinder, so... I'm not sure about this drill bit. Okay, there it is. Here we go. Make sure I'm tight. Okay, it's working so far. You know, I, I checked for metal because I thought I saw a nail from the previous, but I don't think... i am just got to get my earphones on because this is squealing. Here we go. All right. Hey, it looks centered. Let's see how the towel goes. Ah, it's the awesome. sense is killing us. Okay, we got to drill into the leg now. Let's take this off. No more use for that. Yeah, and I think I'll be able to rotate the leg and I can see the grain on this mahogany so that we can align it. I meant to, you know what, before I cut that fiber off, I meant to make a mark, but I did notice that the grain was matching up earlier. That's a nice fit. I'm happy about that. Now here's the leg, and I'm going to go ahead and just pair a little bit off here. There's hardly anything, but it's just a little ragged. There we are. Okay, so let's, we've got to hold this creatively. Let's take this off. <coughs> just set it over side for a second. All right, so there again, that fits pretty nicely, but there's a little movement. This one's going to be a little harder because this leg wasn't as large and I didn't extend those pieces long enough. So I'm just going to get a good clamp right over these pieces. But I want to make sure there's no play here. I'm getting a little bit because these, these turnings have actually gone a little asymmetrical. They, when you check them with the calipers, they're a little different from the time, you know, the shrinking. So I'm going to go around here just a couple times. Okay. All right, that feels better. A little more snug. And so now I think with the clamp, we'll get a pretty good true bite on this thing. Okay, that's good perpendicular and let's throw it on here I mean it looks pretty good it just does is, make you is wonder. the vice any help to you or is the what the vice any help how come yeah I was thinking about that I've got to get it actually I should use leg. I should use the vice for don't know where this one's going today. All right, I feel like that's good. And now I'm gonna drill down this direction. I'm gonna put a little beeswax. Most of the squealing I'm getting, I think, is in my maple guide. So um, we'll see if this does anything. I don't, 
I mean, nothing's really going on there. <laughs> Getting there. I think that's enough. Let's just make sure we're the full depth. All right. All right, let's give it a try. Okay, so. I'll come near you so they can hear you through my mic. stand it up <laughs> and we now have the three-legged table and we're in desperate need I think what I'll do it's pretty close if you spin it you do notice it go a little bit up but I'm I'm happy with that that's pretty sweet now, if the dowel is loose into one side, like it felt a little loose into one side, I'm going to actually take a wood shaving and put a little glue on the dowel into whatever the side, and you can just wrap a shaving around there and let it dry. And then you can lightly sand it, and you will have an enlarged, slightly enlarged dowel for that head, all right? So there we go, I'm liking that. And then I'll just do the same on this other one. This is an eighth of an inch larger, actually. Let's see what it looks like. If I get it under there, this one just feels like it's gonna be slightly longer. I think they're all gonna end up being the same length, actually, I get that on there. And this table will be back. So I think I'll get those done before next week. I'll get it glued on. And we could talk about this table again at some point. I'll probably refresh the finish and we'll get it back into newish condition. I mean, we don't want to take away the, the age of this. Is the leg bowed at all? Say that again? The leg bowed at all? might be slightly, because you do run into that a lot with old pieces, but um, I don't think it's going to, I think it's going to show 
true. And what I really like is, it's hard to see where the seam is. It's on there very nice and flat. And I could even get a little fill in there or some kind of, you know, when you glaze things or when it is glued up, I think I'll just maybe leave a little in there and then, who knows, I don't, I don't really want to put glaze on here, but I think it's going to be a pretty well hidden seam. Let's take this one off. All right, so I would call that a success. I'm very relieved. Danny's curious, uh, is it good to put a groove along the dowel for glue squeeze out relief? Yes, Danny, uh, that is a good idea. It's, it's really important for a glue squeeze out when you have like a suction fit. Like sometimes you put in a dowel and you hear it like pop when it, come, it comes out. That's like a really nice sealed joint. It's almost like if you had a piston with a ring on there, it's such, it actually compresses air, you know, when you're pressing it in. So liquid is even more resistant. So it's good. I usually just make one little um, V chisel cut up the side. And that's enough to do it on a tight fit like that. But thanks for being part of this. Remember, if you like this content, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe. And head on over to epicwoodworking.com if you want to learn more about what we offer over there. We've got lots of courses and even you can move into the neighborhood and be a neighbor <laughs> and get lots of benefits from that too. But thank you once again for hanging out with us on a Thursday night. We'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday. For the camera lady and myself, we'll see you then. <laughs>